Thank you very much. Gil, uh, I think I just counted. This is, I think, my seventh conference on freedom of expression since I came to the court. I seem to become the poster boy for the court on dealing with this issue. Uh, usually I encounter nothing but wrath from the freedom of information community and, and, and expression community when I deal with this issue. So let me, let me try to be brief and make some points about, descriptive points about the current status of convention case law and then secondly move to two or three challenging questions. So first, the nature of the current methodological approach by the court when dealing with defamation cases. Some of this have been sa has been said. Let me mention three issues. First, yes, it is clear that the court now uh, proceeds on the basis that the freedom of, freedom of expression under Article 10 and the principle of reputation under the component of privacy of Article 8 deserve equal respect. That is a development in the case law which has, to some extent, been criticized because it requires the court to engage in a balancing of interests uh, with values considered to be at the same level under the convention. Let me just mention why I think descriptively that has been the trend. I think the court is grappling with a very difficult development, a rapidly developing communication environment where the possible harm to reputational rights is of a, of a sort never before seen in human history, in particular by uh, online journalism. That I think, I, is, whether that's a good or bad reason for that development, that I think is the descriptive view of why the court has proceeded down this road. Point number two, the court has not in any shape or form shied away from the general principle that a high level of protection is afforded to freedom of expression with a correspondingly narrow margin of appreciation in two fields, namely political speech and in matters of public interest. But that, of course, says only half the story. Article 10.2 of the Convention, I think it's very important to realize this, that Article 10.2 of the Convention has very clear textual limitations on freedom of speech. This is not, Europe is not a First Amendment U.S. constitutional environment. We are not in an environment where bright line rules categorically protecting journalists against defamation suits is possible in the current legal landscape. That is a decision made in the 1950s when the European Convention of Human Rights was ratified and drafted. 10.2 talks about duties and responsibilities. It's on the basis of the prong of responsibilities that the court has developed the concept of responsible journalism. Uh, whether one likes, likes that or not, that has now been developed going from only content of information in the MGN versus UK contest mentioned by Judge Shio towards the conduct of the, of the journalist as well as manifested in the Grand Chamber judgment of Pentikainen versus Finland. So in other words, the court will look to several criteria in assessing whether journalists both as regards the content of their publication, but also as regards the conduct of their behavior in the, dis in the obtention, the collection and dissemination of information in accordance with using, to some extent, the benchmarks of journalistic ethics. In this, the court has used the so-called Stoll criteria based on the Grand Chamber judgment of 2007 in the case of Stoll versus Switzerland. These are the criteria the interests at stake, number one, the review of the measures by the domestic courts, number two, the conduct of the journalist, number three, and for the proportionality of the penalty imposed, these are the criteria used in the case of Salihu versus Sweden, the one mentioned by Gill, where the court found manifestly ill-founded an application by a Malmo journalist because of the idea to buy a firearm illegally so as to present a report on the, 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 the easy way in which firearms could be obtained in that particular region. Um, I want to mention here the issue of criminal defamation. I think most of what has been said is absolutely correct. The court does not exclude criminal defamation as such. The court has said that imprisonment on the basis of free speech is not possible or if used will almost certainly create a disproportionate uh, response to the speech measure in question. However, the court has not in any shape or form said that criminal defamation as such uh, 
is not possible under Article 10 because at the end of the day, what the court is looking at is the severity of the consequences for the person in question. Now, whether you are imposed non-pecuniary damage in civil proceedings of 25,000 euros on the one hand or you're fined 10,000 euros in criminal defamation on the other is from the perspective of the proportionality assessment, not the most important thing. What can be important, and I mentioned this, is the question whether the criminal defamation is imposed based on a private type of prosecution between individuals, which is often the case in many states, or whether the criminal defamation laws are enforced through public prosecution, where it is a public prosecutor who uh, proceeds. That, of course, is more of an intense interference with Article 10 rights. My second point deals with the, what I think is very important here, the positive obligations of states that hasn't been mentioned in this context. The positive obligations of states under Article 10, and this is really, I think, where Sanne, Sanne Terlingen's problem arises. It is where private individuals uh, institute defamation suits against other private individuals, notably the journalist, and the question whether there is any positive obligation of states to create a balanced environment there. Now here, the court has said that there, is, there are positive obligations on states under Article 10 uh, to create a favorable environment for the dissemination of speech. Uh, there is a very interesting article in a book published by the Council of Europe called Journalism at Risk, written by a colleague of mine, Tarlak McConaughey, where he talks about positive, positive obligations of states. I would mention that as, uh, as, as a source of literature to read. It is based on the positive obligations in Article 10 cases is based on the famous case of Dink versus, the, versus Turkey, uh, where uh, a journalist encountered violence by other private individuals. The court held that states are required, as I mentioned, to create a favorable environment for participation in public debates by all persons concerned, enabling them to express their opinions and ideas. Now, this, the development of positive obligations under Article 10 is an underdeveloped state under the law. The norms, the set of norms that apply for the positive obligations of states in the field of Article 10 is something that remains to be seen. And here I think we see a lot of questions arise as regards data protection, data processing, uh, 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 to what extent in private to private relations there must be, a, some, must be an opportunity not only based on the journalistic exceptions under data protection laws for journalists to mount an adequate defense in those types of cases. I don't want to say too much about this because, as mentioned by Gil, we have a pending grand chamber judgment in a case from Finland dealing with exactly the issue of the balancing between Article 8 and 10 in the field of data protection and data protection laws under the Convention. The last point that I would make, because I want to pick at some points mentioned by all participants, Yaman, uh, our Turkish professor who is not here, mentioned Article 18. Now that, I think, has, is something very important to take into account. The use, uh, the possibility that governments impose measures on journalists based on motives or legislative aims which can be considered Article 18 type measures which the Convention prohibits absolutely. We have a case now pending before uh, the, the Grand Chamber. It does not deal with uh, journalistic issues, but it deals with the interpretation of Article 18, uh, uh, both in generally to what extent the burden of proof, how we, how, we, how we delineate the burden of proof, who has the burden of proof in demonstrating a political motive, and also the way in which the motive itself must be the predominant purpose for the interference or whether it can only be, it suffices that it is a secondary purpose of interference with perhaps Article 10 rights. That is the case of Merabishvili versus Georgia. It is now pending before the Grand Chamber. I'll be happy to, to answer any question to the extent that I can in our discussion. Thank you.